Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Carl Kunkel, Dean of the College of Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities. Um, it is my pleasure and our pleasure to um, uh, continue our affiliation with the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. Uh, we do have guest speakers that come uh, to campus uh, on occasion, uh, fairly often, once or twice a year. And uh, tonight's event is another continuation of that, of that successful partnership. Um, it is my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, the director of the uh, uh, Tommy Thompson Center, uh, who will then introduce the speaker uh, for this evening. So uh, let me introduce uh, Alex Talk, uh, who is uh, director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center, and, um, and he will take it from there. So please help me welcome Alex to the podium. All right, good evening. So I am Alex Tuck, the director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center. Uh, the Thompson Center is delighted to be able to sponsor tonight's event and work with the UW La Crosse Department of Political Science and Public Administration to bring Casper here to La Crosse tonight. I wanna to thank Regina Goodnow and everyone here at UW La Crosse, as well as Ruth and Mary Kate at the Thompson Center for all your work into putting this event together. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the Thompson Center, allow me to say a few words. The Thompson Center was founded to follow in the footsteps of Governor Thompson, who proudly worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. The Thompson Center seeks to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy by informing and inspiring current and future public leaders, uh, fostering leadership skills, and advancing effective public policy. We work to further these goals by offering public events such as this one, funding research and scholarships, and conducting other activities across the UW system. So, Estonia is a small country of 1.3 million people on the Baltic Sea, neighboring Latvia, Finland, and Russia. It regained its independence in 1991 after decades of Soviet occupation and became a member of the European Union in 2004. In 2014, Estonia launched a first-of-its-kind e-residency program. Under this fascinating and innovative policy, non-Estonians anywhere in the world can become e-residents of Estonia with access to Estonian services such as company formation, uh, banking, payment processing, and taxation. Tonight's guest, Kasper Kurius, was at the center of this program. He served as the founding managing director of Estonia's e-residency program from its launch in 2014 until 2019. He was the most, uh, most cited Estonian by the global press in 2017 and 2018. He was listed in Forbes Estonia's 30 under 30 as number one in technology and finance. Casper now works to help governments worldwide to become digital and borderless. In 2019, Curtius returned to the private sector and formed Pactum, an artificial intelligence-based uh, tool for automating business negotiations. He was elected by U.S. Chief Technology Officer Megan Smith as one of the 20 global digital leaders. Please welcome Casper Curtius. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction and um, and Tommy Thompson Center, first of all, for uh, sponsoring this and uh, and gathering these people everywhere. And uh, I've been here in La Crosse the first time. Uh, I arrived yesterday. It's actually uh, I really like this city. I, I told my colleagues that I'll stay here for a few more days, maybe, because it's very similar to the um, uh, country I'm from, uh, Estonia. So the winters are quite cold, much colder even than here. So. For me, it's a warm, warm day here, and uh, but the lakes and rivers and and the countryside. So, uh, really great to be here. What we will cover today uh, is uh, e-governance, uh, the vision for future states. What I like to say, uh, what nation states could look like in 30 to 50 years' time. Uh, we map this process. 20 years ago and then again 10 years ago and it has followed this path nicely. So I'm a 
I, I hope that uh, these things come true in the next 30 to 50 years time along, so you can have a clips to the future, kind of uh, how it could look like. But then, more importantly, I would like to share with you the journey of how to transform one nation uh, from ex-Soviet Union, where you don't have anything, to a digitally very advanced nation within a matter of years, and how to kind of go about change management in public sector, which usually it's very difficult to disrupt everything. Um, and then, of course, we can have some questions as well. Uh, this, what I'm covering now, is what I call about my previous life. That ended 2019, where uh, I co-founded a startup. And actually, I'm visiting the US quite often now, because, uh, and I'll give two minutes about this, uh, because the rest of the day is about my first part of life is uh, Pactum, uh, where we, our clients are Walmart, Maersk, large, mostly US companies, and we do AI negotiations. So if you know about GPT, very popular chatbots, so we have chatbots for uh, enterprises that autonomously do negotiations uh, with their tens of thousands of suppliers. Uh, within a few years, now we have raised over $35 million and, and hopefully uh, turning this to a private sector unicorn very soon, as e-residency is called the uh, first global uh, government startup unicorn, then, uh, then now trying that in private sector. But building a unicorn in private sector is much simpler than in government, so it should be easy. Uh, I usually help, after e-residency, I have helped many nations, but usually in Europe and Asia, less in the US, but I've been, I've been uh, doing some consulting in the US and, and yes, back in uh, days when uh, uh, President Barack Obama was in the White House, then I had a three-week sessions in the White House with the um, CTO of uh, US, uh, Megan Smith, and then we shared. We didn't have any pictures, so it was uh, secretly taken, these pictures, so that's why they have bad quality. But, uh, but they, uh, we shared about how nation states how, how the lessons of Estonia could be applied to different states in the US and vice versa. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and I hope some of this is still in works. Uh, so, let's imagine the future together. Usually, if I want to I want to change something, then it's easier for me to imagine what the future could look like and then come down from there and, uh, and start making the change happen. So let's imagine what the future of nation states could look like. Uh, in Estonia, we have divided the development of nation states to six different phases. Uh, usually, and we have map where all the nations are, usually nations are struggling to get past from phase one, uh, which we call um, nations getting to know what technology is that mostly still using scanners, signing things on paper, faxing them, and then writing things on PowerPoint or somewhere in documents. Uh, Estonia was lucky that uh, we managed to skip that phase entirely because by the time we got to re-independent 1991, uh, computers and the internet was quite more advanced already and we didn't have the legacy problems, so we didn't have to. I personally even don't have a signature, like I don't know how to sign things on paper, so if someone asks me, then I'm doing random things with my hand, uh, uh, because we have always signed digitally. Uh, and our digital signature there is not the signing mark, uh, like in PDF, uh, as a picture, but just a pin code. So we managed to skip that, and we, in. Uh, 21, so 20 plus years ago, uh, entering the phase two, which is becoming a digital. And becoming digital, uh, first step is having digital identity. Uh, digital identity means that you have a digital name. So my name between humans is Casper, but computers are better in numbers. So my actual name, when I was born, and when my children have been born, they get the number. And not like a social security number that 
uh, you need to hide but the public number. So my actual name is 3871201796. And, and computers understand that number. And what, what it means is that government can now offer me services because they know who I am. And they connect, can, can connect different services with my name. And, and uh, I'm very proud of that number. I think it's, first of all, a beautiful number. And second of all, uh, it allows me to uh, interact with my government. So, why this number is useful is that 15 years ago we started to build App Store. Back then, uh, App Store wasn't the thing yet because there weren't smartphones. So, you managed to log in using your text message, SMS basically. But you managed still to access some services. First service were e-banking. But now, during the last 10 years, 99.8% services are all fully online, meaning that if I want to renew my license, driver license, I log in, I say that I want to renew, I, I uh, sign, and that's it. Next day I have a new driver license. I don't need to upload any documents, and I'll cover that a bit later, how do they get all that, but basically uh, no physical offices for any government services. Uh, no queues for any services. For e-prescriptions, if I fall ill, I call my doctor and I get the e-prescription to my ID card. I need to go to pharmacy and then take the medicine. For tax declarations, it takes seven seconds on average because all the taxes are calculated for you because they have all the data. And then you just need to review it and sign it and accept it. So all of this is possible when you have digital identity. They know who you are. There are services for you. Come back. And there is infrastructure. This seems a messy picture, but this is actually very beautiful by design. So this is the screenshot of digital Estonia. Each of the green node represents one uh, data center, let's say. Uh, one of the largest up there is a population registry. So this registry keeps my name, my email address, my home address, all of the basic data. And there is law in Estonia that none of the other government services is allowed to store that data. The data needs to be in only one place. If they want, for example, driver license registry is this one. If driver license registry wants to offer online service to offer me driver license, they need to ask that data from population registry, which already has there. So that's why it was just one click. They want my picture, they go to passport registry, they want my health records, they go to health registry, they get all the data automatically, and I have a renewed driver license. It's blockchain based before blockchain was there, which means that there is a track of every record. So if I log in, I can see that population registry shared my data, and I can give my allowance to do that. I can remove that, meaning that then I need to go physically in the office. And there is a choice to do that and print out my pictures and uh, documents, but no one does that. Everyone, by default, has approved systems to get your data. And, and the data is always up to date and, and secured. And during cyber wars, which we have more often than you can imagine because of our dear neighbor in East. Uh, it's quite robust because you can't take down the system. You can attack some nodes, but the whole system remains in place. Uh, and, and that's why, and also it's very scalable. So if new service comes, we just add one node and we have all the data and access from everywhere. Uh, so it has been super critical with ID applications and infrastructure which was built then 15, 20 years ago uh, to become a digital nation. And, and part of digital nation, one of the last steps seven, eight years ago was also physical, physical life around us. So this is Estonian company Starship that, that is autonomous vehicle delivering uh, groceries. So basically we have them, thousands of them across Estonia and uh, it's basically free delivery. And, uh, and uh, and for these also, government needs to be in place to apply regulations so that regulations uh, would allow autonomous vehicles and uh, would there was common space. For example, should cars stop to let that robot pass the street? This type of regulations. So this, this was one of the recent ones. But once you are digital and you offer your services to your citizens who live there physically, 
there comes these questions like, should we give and allow Estonians living abroad to access our services? Obvious answer is yes, why should we limit, right? For example, voting. At the moment, yesterday, voting started, so I was here in La Crosse and I was part of my democracy and I voted in general elections in Estonia through my mobile phone. So why should Estonia stop giving me a, being part of my democracy while I'm not in Estonia? Okay, then in 2014, the question was, if we allow Estonians in abroad to be part of our digital nation, why should we stop foreigners to be part of our digital nation? So the concept of e-residency was born, which means that in simple, simple terms, the same ID card, same ID card that we have in our pocket, where is this chip? We started, we allowed foreigners to uh, apply for it. We opened all our 40 embassies globally, where we managed to go physically, pay 100 euros, give your fingerprints, and then you can get this plastic card, digital identity, the same number. We exactly didn't know back in 2014 why and who should apply reasons and why should they do it. Um, what we knew is that in the world of digital nations, you don't have borders. And as a nation, you don't need to conquer other lands to become wealthier and increase your economy. You can just offer more services. You can extend the nation borders digitally so that you will get digital citizens, what we call e-residents. And as an e-resident, you can have some rights, you have some obligations, you have access to services, and you can be part of Estonia without being a resident or citizen of Estonia. So I started to run that, and uh, on the second part of today, we will discuss exactly what were the first steps, but what happened was that this exploded and, uh, and the interest was all over the world to become our digital citizen. Many became just because they wanted to be a part of this future state. Uh, others had real reasons. For example, for example, there is a war in Ukraine and uh, there are over 2,000 Ukrainian e-residents today. Uh, mostly they're running their companies through e-residency, meaning that they have access to European banking system, e-services, and, uh, and despite being in war, they can still keep up and running their companies. And, and, and different people had different interests, but after now five years, there are over 100,000 e-residents, and they are contributing uh, millions of uh, euros in, into our annual budget. But more important than the money is for Estonian national security. So e-residency became a thing for national security because as a small nation you need friends. And if you have lots of friends who are dependent on you and who like, who, who kind of business and business life at least depends on you, then you don't want that land to be conquered. And the goal is that in four years' time, we have 10 times more e-residents than citizens. And in 15 years' time, we can speak about these numbers in hundreds of millions uh, of people who are digitally connected to Estonia. And if the numbers continue to grow, then the whole concept of nation state also changes in many ways. One way how is, uh, is turning people and, and re non-residents into subscribers. So if with 10 million e-residents, each paying 100 euros monthly, today they pay a lot more, we can have a nation state without taxes because we have doubled our GDP only through online subscriptions. 
So we can literally eliminate taxation. If you grow even more, like you can start scaling and your nation state, like you scale startups. Like with at Pactum, our annual growth is five to 10 X annually. Every, every year we grow 500 to 1000%. The same is possible now with nation states, GDP. You don't have to grow three to 5% annually, you can grow 10 times your revenue or budget, as there are no limitations for annual subscription, only 8 billion people. And, and one way how, one day when I'm going back to government, planning to do that is uh, through crypto tokens, Estcoin, uh, which would be global currency uh, for our nation state. And I'm, uh, if you're interested, then you can Google about some articles and blog posts about this. Uh, where basically there would be an opportunity for people to also uh, invest into Estonia. So, because today if you like to invest to a country, like you would like to invest to a uh, private sector company, you don't have much opportunity, right? You can't. Uh, there are bonds, but they have fixed interest rate. So issuing national currencies would help then uh, to be part of Estonia and, and, and support its growth. And interesting thing, especially in this crowd, is what, besides being involved in the service space as an e-resident, what voting rights you could have? How would you be part in the decision-making process? So at the moment, elections are ongoing this week in Estonia, and, uh, and the e-residents don't have voting rights. However, what the residents do is that when I was leading that, we had we had list of laws and the residents voted which laws they would like to change first. And we gathered their input through that and then we took it to parliament and parliament changed within five years in my time only like 14 different laws, legislations. So it wasn't officially that they are not, they are like allowed to vote for their parliamentary members, but uh, digitally they are already today part of our legislative decision-making process. The question now is that if our income will be based on online subscribers, how much we are willing to give them more rights in our democratic process, how our nation kind of develops. Obviously, for local citizens, there must be a priority for these matters. Uh, but I would argue that the time comes when we want them to have more direct say also about who governs nation states and, uh, and at least have one seat in 150 seats that would help uh, help to bring uh, bring in their their voice basically how they see Estonia to continue phase number 4 that we entered just a few years ago and this process is is take is is longer process is uh, turning now this digital platform of local and foreign subscribers into AI-driven technology. Uh, with AI-driven technology, we have seen in recent weeks of Microsoft's and Google's how AI can, can become so advanced as uh, uh, through this chatbot, for example, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. What, what AI capability really in government is much more powerful than in private sector. For example, what we are doing, and we are doing preventive medicine. We have DNA data of Estonians who voluntarily gave that. We have database of different sicknesses and illnesses and, and, we, and, and through private sector collaboration, we are doing preventive medicine. Basically, you can get the letter that, hey, you have risks of this, this type of uh, 
illness is higher than on average and, and we offer you these treatments. With the AI decision making, we have also chatbot, for example, proactive chatbot. For example, if I came to the US uh, four months ago, I got a notification that my passport is expiring soon. Then I answered to the chatbot, no, that it lasts for five more months. And chatbot answered, yes, but for this type of visa, your passport needs to be valid six months when you return. Uh, I said, okay, and chatbot issued a, a new passport and I had to collect it. So when you put AI layer on top of the data and, uh, and uh, digital services, then it can actually start living like a separate human in that sense, work for people, and form decisions. I truly believe that the way how decision making in government is done today is, uh, is something we are laughing about in 20, 40 years time, where we have huge huge mandate for humans to form decisions on matters that that influences tens of millions of people and based based on some gut feelings emotions or very limited uh, uh, data that is available to them and uh, and I believe that when we already see today that the AI will do recommendations about policies about taxations uh, shows our benefits then at the moment there is a human involved who accepts these changes of course reviews and accepts them but if you click the button green button that you accept them 20 years in a row then one day you discover that you're not relevant to click the button anymore and you we don't need that layer of politicians in that way which means that these nation states digital platforms that are cross-border would start running on their own and growing on their own, both on revenue and, and, and other matters. And this is a bit maybe too futuristic, but, but very visible already uh, in private sector. And, uh, and there is no reason whatsoever that public sector is somehow different. So, where we have reached now with the next phase of digital development is building on the concept of nation as a service. Meaning that if now Estonia has invested and created this digital platform and layer and allowed authentication and have AI application layer on top of that, there is no reason that other nations all need to do the same thing true. Like in private sector, if you want to download something, you can download that in App Store. And the same we see is happening in public sector, that each government and nation don't need to build their services themselves. They can go to App Store and download services for their citizens. And in some sense, we, it's already now ongoing, for example, with our neighboring country, Finland, we are uh, starting to share the code base and applications uh, between nations. And when you remember the first picture with the CTO of US, Megan Smith, then I had a slide of uh, offering our services as API uh, to, to the United States. And we had discussions then uh, what could be the first services that uh, what we have built, uh, we can offer here. And, and we see in Estonia that this way we could kind of support the development of many emerging nations and, and uh, a much faster space uh, if we allow them to kind of become digitally more advanced much quicker than today. So, to conclude this part of the session, then I believe that nations are becoming independent from their own physical land, meaning that if you want to grow, you don't need to conquer land, you need to offer better UX for your services. Citizens, if you want to grow, 
you do marketing about your digital services to other nations. Revenue, as we see that there are many different ways how you can earn revenue besides taxing your people only. And start serving humanity uh, like never before. Thank you for the first part. Let's continue. Uh, we can have some questions later. Sounds easy. I have this privilege to ex share how kind of one part of that digital journey was taken through and, uh, and what, what exactly uh, were the steps there to, uh, to turn, it, turn it around. Thank you so much. I'll do a 10 second break. Thank you. So, the story and how it really happens. 1991, similar thing as at the moment you can see pictures in media. Uh, last tanks in Estonia, uh, Soviet Union collapsing. Estonia gathers uh, what we call a, a singing revolution where there are like 10, 20 percent of Estonians in one square and uh, singing, uh, singing free, singing for, for freedom. And, and uh, managed to get this freedom and the picture here shows an article of the first, one of the first prime ministers back then, Martlar. Martlar back then actually put me together and connected me here. So. Uh, he's still still out there, uh, but the crazy thing is that this guy was just I don't know a few years younger than me, becoming prime minister of a nation state. And uh, and since then we have had prime ministers, ministers who are even 27, 28 years old. Not that you need to be young, uh, but it is somehow easier to be stupid and do crazy stuff if you are young. Uh, because you don't know anything, and and this is how it really worked in Estonia. That if you don't know much and you have a nation to run, then you just start figuring out what the nation could be. And um, and uh, Martlar initiated many reforms, monetary reforms, privatizations, uh, but also digitalization. Because you had so poor that if you don't have any money, then you can't. I don't know, serve your citizens, right? You can't build offices across, across your nation. And uh, what then happened, 1996, there was a program called Tiger Leap. It was initiated by uh, President uh, Thomas Andrew Kilves, who was president uh, five years ago in Estonia. Uh, he actually studied, uh, uh, lived in the in the U.S. Uh, for for decades, and uh, and and was uh, uh, was lecturer in Stanford University recently. And he had the vision that computers is something that we are go is going to stay, and uh, uh, without much budget, somehow managed to put computers to every school in Estonia. So I'll just walk through just some uh, steps towards the full digitalization and how long it took. This picture is from 1991. This is, uh, says free training. It was training how to uh, digitally sign. This was actually first picture uh, and I worked there. So I had this booth and then I helped uh, people to know what is digital signature and how to use ID card. And I took this picture. Uh, the lady there is Karen. And uh, it was first day when we met, and we are still married. So <laughs> we actually moved together the same day there. Uh, and it was my way secretly to take a picture of her. So. so, but this is what happened: that we trained through this booth uh, 
10% of Estonians how to digitally sign, basically. And then they trained their own parents, etc. So there's been a lot of training involved uh, throughout the society, how to use technology and how it can help you. And I'll give you then the example of this four years period of high, how, 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 how you took it forward and, and what were the steps there. How to, how to do something radically different in private sector. Uh, so 2014, this guy here is Tavi Kotka, former CIO of Estonia. Uh, created this blog post that let's have 10 million Estonians, so 10 times more e-residents than, uh, than we have citizens. It was just a legal hack, what I call, is that just in legislation, it was just two sentences changed that this ID card can be issued also to foreigners, nothing, nothing more. Just few sentences changed in legislation and went unnoticed. But we turned this to a, into a marketing uh, and PR campaign very soon, so you don't have to actually see the slides, they're actually copy-paste of, of the real work what went through. So I entered to the space without knowing what is e-residency and why they should come. So what we did, we took this as a startup, so we started to, and what startups do, you iterate, you put something to the market and you learn from your users uh, what they want, and then you offer these services and you kind of daily base iterate compared to how usually governments work is that you do a lot of research and then you have a great idea and then you build it for four years, lots of tenders and then no one uses that. So, and, and then you'd start changing legislation. So this, this, this time we start, thought that we need to do it other way around, like, like startups do. We listed all the user stories, what we thought that the residents could do. We map whether they can do it or, or what's the status there. We created a landing page where you can manage to subscribe to become a digital citizen of Estonia without having legislation in place or anything. Uh, we got, we, <laughs> and then I asked the president to tweet about this, uh, to become our digital citizen, and within the single Twitter tweet, and we got 4,000 subscribers within the first day. And we thought, okay, uh, that's great. Uh, then we thought, okay, let's use the momentum. Then we came to US. We went to, uh, this was back then Prime Minister of Estonia there, again, 32 years old, I think. Uh, Stanford University in New York, Times Square. Uh, we gave, issued first e-residency cards uh, to Tim Draper and Steve Urvetson there. Uh, they had the VC together. And the problem again was that then we figured that we can't issue e-residency cards because they need to travel to Estonia. We didn't have embassies open to give fingerprints. So then we managed to find the legislation again where it was a third reading last, last week before legislation is turned into law. We managed to put the sentence <laughs> there that for VIP e-residents, they don't need to come to Estonia and we can issue them through a minister's signature. So another hack kind of how to change some legislation. We put that in printed cards. We offered them e-residencies. Uh, they were the first in the US then. Uh, and then lots of media followed, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, basically everyone speaking about that. But of course, we still didn't have any services or anything they could do with the card. But this gave me thousands of people who are interested to become a digital citizen. And through that, what startups do, they start mapping the needs and desires of these people. So this is a slide from 2014 then, or 2015, of different type of personas who could become and why they would like to become e-residents. We had tourists who wanted to use this as a, a loyalty card, basically, to get some discounts in some services. We had hackers who wanted to use the system. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, our neighbors who had investments to Estonia and they wanted to manage these investments, to digitally sign some contracts. Stanislav there from Ukraine was one of the persona who became our main persona who we started to concentrate. He didn't, he didn't have access to a real business environment uh, because Ukraine didn't have these services like PayPal and stuff. So a lot of people 
uh, joined EU residency uh, to be able to do business globally, from India, from globally, everywhere. Um, we maybe don't know, but ma ma many people, most people globally don't have opportunities even to accept credit card payments. So through e-residency, you log in, you become digital citizen through Estonia. You establish the Estonian company, bank account, and you have access to all the services. Next step, you start figuring out, okay, Stanislav Jurin is the person we want to offer the service. And what you do, you map the user journey. So basically, this is a picture with, uh, together with students, uh, one group of students uh, worked for four months with us, uh, where we mapped uh, from the initial process of how you become an e-resident to actually running services that, uh, what are missing points, what legislation needs to be changed, what services need to be built, and stuff like that. After this was mapping done, then this slide shows the budget, uh, the plan that we took to the Prime Minister and Cabinet's office about who do we need to hire. So first time actually getting budget. Before that, uh, I didn't get paid for this. Uh, so budget to get 10 million Estonians, you need legal person, you need marketer, you need stuff like that, and what would be the role? And this was the slide about what changes we need to do. So legal changes, EU residents had to be linked to Estonia, we had to eliminate the link, to get the online bank account, to open more embassies, stuff like that. So everything map, and this is usually where public sector starts their work, they start mapping what needs to be done. But in our case at least, and I would argue in most cases, you don't know to map that if you don't have real users. So uh, Then what we did, we created a vision like startups have, where do you want to reach? Our vision was uh, back then a bit different. It wasn't extending Estonia to a digital nation, it was to create a total new nation state. This didn't work out because e residency had very strong ties to Estonia. But back then it was to become a total new nation, like you have these nations on islands or something. Uh, uh, very important branding. We had these nice ID card boxes before we issued ID cards in envelopes and, uh, and this uh, didn't sell so we created these nice uh, boxes and, uh, and people started to take pictures of these selfies with this and really helped. Built an organization, has budget now for 8 million and had a 20 member team. And what was important was that um, managed to get Estonian salaries are quite poor on global wise, I would say, still, uh, still is, but like, no, I don't want to say numbers, but very, very small, let's say. Uh, so you couldn't hire global talent, but when you build also startups, you need global talent, basically. It gets as good as people you get. So what we did, we managed to get exception in public sector, how we can uh, hire people and we managed to get five times higher salaries um, than on average. And then people came with like 90% cut <laughs> globally. Arnaud here, there was uh, French president of Holland, uh, PR advisor. We had Indian prime minister, uh, cabinet members. Out of 20 members, I had only two Estonians basically. We had a global team. Uh, American startup founders, ex-unicorn people, for example. Uh, I see he's not here. Uh, and, uh, oh, this guy with glasses, Alex, is from Michigan, so I'm quite close by. Uh, and this really helped us to kind of put e-residency uh, globally everywhere and, and, and build this. But, uh, yeah, it was quite funny because... Um, non-Estonians, building a Estonian nation like that. What we did then was that lots of people got lot of quite angry about everything we did because we used Estonian government brand on doing crazy stuff that kind of wasn't uh, politically agreed or, or no one consulted about anything. And so the, our president had to always 
talk about what the EU residency team does in public media interviews. And um, the new president, she didn't like that too much. And, and at one point of time, we couldn't kind of do it alone anymore because every kind of government division was so involved about addressing the problems that uh, we were creating. Um, so what happened was that we had to start working together with uh, public sector people. So this is a picture where back there, end of this uh, table, it's uh, President Kersti Kaljulaid. Here is Tavi Kotka, here is me. And the rest of the people, like you see, they don't feel to be too happy to be in this meeting. Uh, but they are then from both private and public sector. We are head of Bank of Estonia, head of Banking Coalition, five different ministers from finance, uh, justice, internal affairs, external affairs. Uh, my favorite people, uh, police and border guard, secret police, uh, uh, who all tell uh, how e residents are all criminals and launder money. So, uh, so everyone came together and president had just one message. That basically, you can't eliminate the residents anymore. Like, it's, it's there. Uh, you now we need to, like, handle it. And uh, let's start working together. And then I apologized and, and listened to everyone. And, uh, and we started working together after a few years. And, uh, and now e residents became kind of official government thing. And everyone had their responsibilities. And... Uh, and it started to kind of uh, grow more steadily. Uh, I didn't, we didn't end the craziness PR uh, still. Uh, we went with presidents and with the same president now in Korea. And we signed many government to government deals. And, and lots of uh, uh, prime ministers became e residents. Lots of global. Uh, uh, so Richard Branson here. Global group of uh, known people became e-residents. And this was our way of marketing. So I mentioned some numbers before, but um, I'm not going there again. But what was important was to measure the financial impact of e-residents as well. So Deloitte was conducting a study and showed, showed how one invested euro there brought back 139 euros. So the ROI was pretty crazy. So uh, that's why we managed to increase the budget. Because we, we built the sales, like you have sales funnels in private sector, right? You do some marketing, one euro, one dollar to marketing, then you measure how many leads you get, you measure how many leads transfer to clients, and what's the stickiness of clients, and how many start paying, and how much they pay, and how much leave. And then you know that how much, uh, whether it's scalable and whether you can put more dollars into it. So the same way with e-residency. The sales funnel of e-residency is that you are part of the PR, you read about e-residency, the then you become e-resident. And interestingly then, not only that you establish a company and be connected to Estonia, first is connected through business, then connected virtually, uh, uh, with other domains, because usually you became a fan of Estonia, and then you wanted to know about the culture of Estonia, and sometimes visited Estonia, and, and being in the cultural kind of collaboration space. After that, what do you think the sales funnel is? To become resident of Estonia, then to become citizen of Estonia. So still citizenship is the highest value, uh, but there is a clear kind of sales funnel towards citizenship. And you don't have to become citizen. Uh, you, uh, that wasn't exactly the goal. Um, but it was very measurable. <sighs> That's end of the second part. And last part is very small. So another 10 second break. Thank you. So if you're in, uh, if you're wondering whether what was what something specific to take away, then I usually like to give those specific takeaways. First takeaway is that if you haven't figured that already, then I would recommend you to go to public sector at least once in your lifetime, 
and uh, because there is so much untapped potential there. Like, private sector is so competitive and so advanced in so many ways, while public sector is so lack of everything. So if you want to make a change happen, then, then actually you can be much more needed in public sector. Second, what usually people do in public sector, they start doing marketing. There are different cities or nations or states all have their marketing campaigns, how they are the best. What is my recommendation is that figure out clear problems you can solve and build products as a government or as a state and then uh, uh, yeah, solve those problems with your products. And then the marketing comes by itself. Launch early and learn. This was the other way how usually governments act. Uh, and because you don't know what needs to be done, basically, you need to daily based learn and, 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 and set realistic uh, uh, metrics how you measure the success. You need to measure in dollars because eventually politicians need to give you that money and they give you money if they see dollars or at least some fame. Uh, with public servants, it's, it's, you can't, dollars don't matter as much, but fame matters, so then they need to be on a picture. So everything you do, they need to get the credit, basically. Um, in moral community, when we, we had a library of all the materials, videos, slides, and everyone managed to use this. And so basically we had, at one point, tens and tens of people globally speaking about e-residency on the stages without me knowing. We had country managers and we had city managers, so basically we had e-residence communities from Berlin to Tokyo, yeah, organizing events, gathering local e-residents. Sometimes we visited them as a team members as well. But this really uh, made, made it very scalable. So as a government, in private sector, it's obvious, again, you involve your customers and you build community, but for some reason, we don't think that in a government. Content is still a king. This was very cool that we were very vulnerable about what we do. We had a blog post, a blog site about e-residency, and we basically once per week wrote something and uh, wrote what we planned, what didn't work, who works with us, who works against us. Uh, and, uh, and everyone liked this blog post. There are blog posts uh, getting millions of views uh, and Estonians also reading them. So in a government to be open about what to do is a thing for some reason again. Uh, I don't have a picture here, but uh, uh, I was politely asked to remove it one day, but establish public sector change management strategy, meaning that it's quite difficult to make changes happen uh, with civil servants because mostly they are hired there to keep the status quo. So basically, uh, if you want to change something, you are making their lives harder and they don't get more money or more fame or anything. You just hire risk. So what do you do? So we had this, <laughs> what we called, uh, change uh, st stairs, basically 10 different steps what we need to do if people don't collaborate. First step is pretty simple. You meet with the person and you, exp you share your views and you try to make the change. Then you meet the person boss. If that doesn't work out. <laughs> Number third step in Estonia was uh, going through a politician, uh, whether a prime minister or a different minister. But that turned out to be a very weak way of changing because for some reason politicians in Estonia don't have that level of power. Uh, so if this didn't work, uh, very last steps became quite ugly there. Uh, the, the ninth step was to go to media and pitch about different people who don't work and then if their picture is on media then they became collaborative. Um, and the funny thing is no one thought that you were the one who put that picture there. Um, but, uh, but media really helped. Uh, and this is the 10th step. 10th step is just do it, don't ask permission. And an example here is that know, know when to ask permission and when to ask for forgiveness. Mm, 
This is the former president of European Central Bank, and this is the new president of European Central Bank. Mm, uh, and Draghi. And when Draghi was president, then, uh, I wanted to launch Estcoin, the picture of what you saw before, a digital currency. And he was uh, quite against that. Uh, and uh, and uh, we had meetings in, in Europe and uh, with the Estonian president and Estonian uh, uh, bank president and Mm. And uh, yeah, they didn't like to have anything alternative to euro uh, for some reason. Uh, and what happened later, though, if the new president uh, was elected, then uh, uh, she liked that innovation. And actually, uh, now it, it's not called Estcoin, it's across Europe and it's called Digital Euro. And hopefully launching soon, meaning that in across Europe uh, we can have cryptocurrencies maybe uh, as part of our our uh, payment methods. Basically, in simple terms, it would mean that the ID card, that if I work in public sector, then my salary don't need to go to a bank account. It can go to my ID number. And it's up to me whether I want to give it to private hand banks or I will, if I owe you some $10, I will transfer to your ID card that $10. So we all have budgets here and wallets here. Uh, so it could be pretty cool. Um, anyway, nine out of ten or whatever uh, um, tips put every stakeholder work for you. Uh, establish protection. These two guys, Tavikot and Simsi, could basically there were many people who didn't want me uh, or the team to be there. So uh, uh, these guys helped me out, uh, not to get fired or or something worse. And uh, and that's of course very needed. That whether it's minister or someone who can uh, fight for you uh, and for your rights, otherwise uh, otherwise it's difficult. Uh, get mandate to hire the best, as shared before. And very last one, leave and come back. Uh, after four five years in public sector, you are becoming uh, mentally a bit disrupted. So it's good to re return, go back. One day, maybe, and I do plan to go back, but it's important not to stay for too long. I think uh, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> there are some questions also, and we have some time for Q and A. If you have questions, you can ask yourself, or uh, we can discuss about this. But I'll just leave this slide here. So if you have any, uh, you can discuss. Uh, discuss about these things. Does anyone have any questions here? Yes, please. And we have a mic because online people would like to hear the questions as well. So if uh, if you can share the mic, then. And uh, Dean had. You sort of quickly mentioned that the data was secure. I mean, could you talk a little bit more about that? There's a lot of uh, hype or concern in the U.S., for example, about identity theft and people getting other people's data, opening up credit cards, stealing their money, those types of things. So how is this protected against those types of threats? Yes, yes, it's a good question. And in Estonia, for example, anything that is on paper is not trusted anymore. Because if things are on paper, then you don't know who reads your paper, who don't know who changed your data. Uh, data in your paper, who has made photocopies of that, who has faked your signature on paper. Uh, and so all the policy is that only digital, uh, no paper records. So if things are digital, then there are some basic IT hygiene that needs to be there. Basic, basic is encryption. Like uh, when you log in using pin one, it's all encrypted, that only your card can uh, decrypt it. With your pins, if you lose your card, no one can do anything with your card because uh, it needs pins as well. And it's not like credit cards in the U.S. where you have these three numbers on the back around. So if you steal someone's wallet, you can use it. Uh, so you can't do anything with the plastic card. The card chip doesn't in, uh, include any any data. And on online world, there are then these divisions who can access your data uh, if you have given rights to do that. But there will be log and notification if someone does that. So basically, you can see 
which ID card I, which person accessed your data. And there has been an incident, a police officer ac uh, accessing uh, his uh, ex-girlfriend's data and then uh, he lost the police license after that. So basically everything leaves a digital footprint of every action. And this has made it uh, very, very secure and safe. So when I first read about this and hearing about this now, one of the first questions that come to mind is, how can we do something like this in, in Wisconsin uh, or in the United States? Uh, and I can think of at least some ways in which there would be different challenges uh, or you know, p advantages that you had in Estonia. Obviously, you know, the US is much larger, um, much greater share of both the global population and especially of the global economy, uh, potentially you know, making it harder to scale in the same way you could here. And secondly, uh, you had, I think, an advantage in, uh, in Estonia and things already being fairly digital in a way that they are probably not here. Um, and, you know, that transition seems much more difficult. There's, I think, more sort of status quo bias already built up here than there. So how applicable would this be here? How much are the, would those challenges be obstacles here and yeah. can they yeah. be overcome? Yeah, let's go over this. So uh, thank you for the question. So um, where to start? First, size does not matter because, for example, India has a system of Adhar, 1.3 billion people. They issued million Hadar ID accounts per day. <laughs> so if India can do it, the US could do it, I would argue. Um, so what then matters? Yes, old practices can't be copied to this age because, you know, 25 years ago life was very different. Um, mostly main concern is not why politicians don't do it, is that people don't want it because people don't trust governments with anything, obviously. Uh, good reasons. But what people don't understand, of course, what is the alternative way? I think the problems of identity thefts and everything. I was listening to radio also while uh, Ubering uh, yesterday here and uh, the worst is digital identity thing so I think it's hot topic uh, here at the moment so we don't have digital identity depths because because today's technology allow to be safe than uh, than anything else so so it's a mindset question because you trust much much more of your data to private sector companies anyway uh, than governments and uh, and uh, and in Estonia it's other way around like we don't trust let's say your Googles and Microsofts, as we trust government. Uh, because government, we see the legislation, how it's governed, and, and, and we know technology. Uh, so uh, I, I would argue it's a mindset question, and it, the need needs to come from people uh, to push politicians to, to form these changes. Uh, and there is, it's inevitable it needs to happen. Like, Government needs to know who you are. That's the basic government role. The government know, doesn't know who you are. And government knows who you are on physical life because issuing passports and stuff. And, you know, they know anyway where you are because they have access to your app, so they know where you are anyway. So it's like it wouldn't be anything new <laughs> to have a digital name that you don't need to hide. But government needs to offer services and security, and in order to offer a service, they need to have a digital way to in engage. And if you don't do it today, you do it in 30 years, then you're even m much more far behind. Like e-residency is now in seven different nations already across the world, from Israel to Ukraine to, to Zurich. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan even has e-residency. So there is no reason why United States or any local states kind of uh, could have that. Uh, it's just about the will. Basically, the difference still of blockchain technology being accepted. Isn't that what you're really getting at? Um, it's, it's more about uh, that if, name, if, the digital name, the number. People are but scared that's only if you possible. That's uh, only possible because it's done on the blockchain that they can trust it. So the, isn't it really the record there that is, everybody yes. understands that technology yeah. first? Yeah, the encryption and blockchain type of technology that 
has a digital footprint of every inter engagement. But basics are like very basic, like in private sector, like encryption. Like people still use current service by, I don't know, logging in and then secret password you can get if you answer what's your maiden name or which school you attended. And then you can log into the system. Like this is silly, right? And then you don't trust government for these topics. Um, so then the question is why, right? What others are doing with e-residents? With e-residents, you can do, of course, many things. But of course, first step would be still for your own residents and citizens before you do e-residents. So uh, you turning the services digitally first, locally, and and then then expanding them. Um, and need to de detect, like I helped the Ukrainian President Zelensky's uh, IT minister uh, and their cabinet a few years ago before the war. And there, there was a World Bank's master plan of 60 pages, kind of how to tar transform Ukraine to a digital nation. And, and today, by the way, Ukraine has the same uh, infrastructure already implemented that Estonia has, and also the same ID cards. Basically, they have, they have passed this. Uh, they are more advanced than most other nations now already digitally. And, and what, what worked there also, and what, what worked in Estonia is, start with very specific services what you find most valuable as a citizen, what you would like digitalized with your government. In Estonia, it was quite funny, actually. It wasn't online voting or e-prescription or online taxes, although taxes in the US would be pretty cool, right? I've heard it takes weeks. Uh, but it was, you managed to get discounts on bus tickets, I think, if you bought them through ID card, like 50 cents cheaper. <laughs> And then people, because uh, it was this kind of cheaper, then people did it. And why it was cheaper, the same with driver license, 20 euros cheaper, is that you just need, don't need physical offices. So you're incentivized to offer them digitally as a government. And then it's win-win, basically. And if it's cheaper as a citizen, then you subscribe, you you have the card, and you start using it. Uh, so it was very financially motivated to use digital services and to digitalize as a government uh, to save money. So figure out ways which are very expensive at the moment, uh, where you can save money and offer that money as a discount to your citizens or make it cheaper. Then people start using them. I was just wondering, um, what have you seen as far as hacking or fraud or, I mean, because it seems obviously so easy if we could get rid of all of the credit card fraud and the bank fraud that we are experiencing. What, what do you see on that side? What's the difference? I mean, what's the difference of after digitalized? Right, the fraud levels. Yeah, yeah. Like what is Estonia known is that we don't have uh, corruption. We haven't had for some long time already. Because if you're uh, digital, then again, it leaves a footprint. So if there are no cash involved, basically you can't bribe anyone. So this was one thing happened many 20 years ago or even some of the other Soviet Union countries still struggling with that, then we didn't have it. And, uh, and that was the main benefit. Um, but uh, uh, for example, when we launched e residents, then yeah, these uh, government organizations kind of were panicking because you know you, you can start laundering money through Estonian stuff, and and it take, took like many many years before they understood the same issue that you if you want to launder money or do harm, you don't give your fingerprints to your government and do online service that can be traced everything you do. You you go to a nation where you can do them with cash and and where everything is not that transparent and tractable. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, this this has helped, uh, yeah, with uh, with corruption and uh, and bureaucracy in general, uh, that to avoid that entirely. And hence, people start trusting politicians again. Like I don't know exactly the latest polls in the U.S., but in in Europe. Many nations, it's a real problem. Like people don't trust politicians, uh, and and they don't trust because these things happen all the time. So, but uh, if 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 it's digitalized, then I would argue that this really boosts the trust uh, trust as well. There.
this might be kind of a weird question, um, but like, what about like if the technology is so strong for something like this, would it be possible for hackers also to be super strong and be able to get into this? Because from like a standpoint of like the US, it's so big, like what if some people would go into this, but some people would say no, so like their fingerprints wouldn't be in the system. Like would, yeah. would there be a chance for like being able to hack, drain accounts, take identities, things like that? Yeah, no, if it, if it, the physical document needs to be there, a physical token to log in, and only that has decryption, then uh, you can't access that data. It's all encrypted. Uh, and there is no way. It's like encrypted WhatsApp messages, like you can't access those WhatsApp messages. What you can hack, of course, it's when you're not encrypted and you don't have those tokens, uh, like in nine, 190 other nations, then you should be concerned about cyberspace. Uh, and every day, these things don't reach the news anymore because people don't click on those news anymore. But every day, your data is leaking somewhere. Like, you you have subscribed to, on average, like 300 plus applications or services. And every day, through some way, or every, okay, not every day, every week, your data is leaked. Uh, and and that's that's the main reason why this type of, encrypted blockchain supported technology in government levels are, are needed uh, with physical tokens. Um, and people think sometimes that if it's not like that, then, uh, then it's secure. But, but yeah, we don't, we don't understand that if someone would send me a contract and sign it on paper, then this is very suspicious. Like, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't follow why, why there must be something wrong. If my health records would be physically in some paper, like one person who would like harm, they can change my plot type and I can die. And I don't have a track record of who has changed my plot type. So that's how Estonians don't trust anymore these traditional ways how governments are managing uh, data. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and we have many cases like, I know maybe more famous cases for you is like Michael Schumacher, the, uh, former driver, like his medical records were stolen from hospital in Germany. Like in our case, you can't steal, you can't access, you can't steal data. Um, and uh, that, yeah, that is, I think, something basic hygiene. What uh, what needs to be there uh, taking place in the, in every government? Last question. What about? You're talking about services the government offers, but what, and I don't know if they have this in Estonia or how you do your social welfare or your, right? What about things that do have that monetary value? How can, how do you distribute that and how do you keep that safe? If, you, if I can sort of yeah. follow on that, uh, I guess, uh, but I think, I think related to that, what about sort of equity concerns here that people, with poor access to the technology, poor access to the internet, yeah, you know, sort of yeah. become second class citizens. There is, yeah, there is, uh, there are, there is always opportunity to go physically and do stuff. So it's not like uh, it's fully eliminated. But for example, there was a huge concern regarding voting, like if it's digital voting. And this week, I think all the voting has been digitalized for the last sixteen years. I think only this year, and this voting will be the first one, there is over 51% votes uh, through digital, digital and rest still office, because voting is very traditional thing, so many people want to suit up and go and vote physically still, while most other services are only digital. So there, was, there were concerns that, uh, that if it's only digital, then uh, yeah, people who have more difficult to access digital services, uh, uh, quite often referred to as elder people, don't vote. And turned out other way around. In Estonia, it's much more snowy than here, and uh, and uh, and elder people uh, didn't go on physical booth to vote because it was struggle, and they are voting more digitally. So after 20 years of these trainings of this booth, these computers, all the children and grandchildren, age is not topic at all. Whatever age you are, you're used and comfortable using all these digital services. Thank you, everyone. And
Thank you online.